Okay, everybody. Uh, I think it's uh, looks like six six o'clock has rolled around. Um, good to have you all with us. Uh, thanks for being here uh, for another episode of uh, uh, Computing Bits. Um, trying to uh, give you all an idea of um, what to expect uh, as you uh, as as incoming students coming into the College of Computing. Um, so uh, today we've got a um, we've got a, a a lineup of people who, um, well, uh, the the focus the, the, this week is sort of on uh, kind of the practicalities of um, of being a student um, at tech. Um, so uh, I've invited uh, various people who um, are in charge of some of the the uh, the nuts and bolts, you know, the uh, practical things um, about uh, being on campus and uh, and being a student. Um, and I've also uh, invited some current students and some alumni um, to talk about, um, yeah, what it's like to actually be a, uh, be a student here at Tech. Um, so I'm gonna introduce uh, a, few, a few of our guests. Um, the format for, for today is going to be kind of um, uh, open-ended. Uh, the idea is uh, I'll have everyone kind of introduce themselves and, and talk a little bit about what they do, but, um, but the, um, the it's up to you the students to come up with uh, questions for people so there are things that you, uh, you've been you've been meaning to ask about things things that you're curious about um now's the time to to ask okay so um let, let me uh let me introduce uh some of our guests um for, so i'll have uh as i uh mention your name if you could uh make sure your video is on so people can see you and, and say hi uh so uh first of all we've got uh danielle mayro um, from uh, Residence edu Education and Housing, right? Is that correct? Yep. Um, so my name is Danielle Miro. I'm a Residence Education Coordinator. So I oversee East McNair Hall up on the hill at Michigan Tech, mm -hmm. um, which is also home to the CSLC, the Computer Science Learning Community. So if any students are involved in that community, I do oversee that area. Um, we were hoping to have an RA on, but they don't start till Friday. So <laughs> I'm here for now, but they'll be happy to answer your questions later on too. Great. Thanks for being here, Danielle. Great. So, um, right. If, if you have questions about, you know, sort of the what it's like to live here, <laughs> to, to be be a, um, on campus, um, and if you if you happen to be part of the computer science learning community, um, or, you, or you want to learn more about um, what that's that's like, um, Danielle's here to talk about that. Um, we have uh, Josh Olson, who is the head of uh, IT at Michigan Tech. Josh, are you there? Yeah, I am, absolutely. So my name is Josh Olson. I'm the Chief Information Officer. Uh, that means basically that I'm responsible for the IT environment on campus. The IT department at Michigan Tech is a centralized IT department, which means that our organization is responsible for support and service of all things related to IT on campus, whether that be um, helping students with their laptops or managing the lab environment or providing software support or enterprise development. If it involves a computer or a network, uh, we're, we're, we are here to help. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Bonnie Henderson, who is um, in, charge, uh, in charge of the uh, College of Computing's uh, Learning Center. Uh, Bonnie, are you, are you there? Yes, hi, I'm Bonnie. Um, I'm the supervising coach of the CCLC. And that's pretty much where students can come in for tutoring, anything computing related. And all of our workers are undergraduates. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so um, I think something interesting to point out uh, with regard to the Learning Center is it's a great resource for learning, um, but you can also work there, right? Um, so. Yes, I'm a student too. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, right. So, um, uh, glad to have you with us, Bonnie. Thanks. And um, well, I, I, my, my plan here is to introduce everyone, and then we'll kind of cycle around and um, and talk uh, talk more at length. Um, uh, Sarah Larkin is um, a student who's also uh, also involved with the Learning Center. Let's say hi, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. <laughs> I'm a fourth year student in computer science, and I've also been a learning center coach for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks for being here. 
Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Rafael Mudge, um, who is a distinguished alum of our um, computer science program um, and someone who I haven't seen in, in many years. He used to be one of my students. Um, Rafael, are, are you there? Yeah. Hey, Chuck, can you hear me? I sure can, yeah. Yeah, I was in the first class you ever taught uh, once you came to tech. You poor guy. You poor guy. <laughs> Finite state automata. <laughs> Great to see you. Uh, to give, it, give us a 30-second uh, summary of your life. Oh, sure. Hey, I'm uh, Rafael, Rafael Mudge. I live in uh, Washington, DC. And uh, I was active duty Air Force. I did ROTC. And I'm an entrepreneur in uh, cybersecurity and um, have started a few companies, um, a consulting firm and a product, uh, a security testing product company uh, run product called Cobalt Strike. And I recently sold my company actually to uh, Help Systems in Minnesota, who does uh, employ some tech grads as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think that, uh, there's certainly a lot of students who are uh, interested in um, things security related. So um, Rafael is uh, really an expert in this area. So uh, very glad to have you with us. Um, let's see. Next, uh, 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 Ann Chisla is. Um, a student who's uh, graduated with her uh, her undergraduate degrees and is now um, involved in the um, accelerated master's program. Um, and you want to say hi? Yeah, hello. Um, so, like he said, I graduated with my undergrad computer science degree in December 2019. So now I'm in the accelerated master's program. So this is my last semester. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, right, that's, and I think that's an interesting um, option maybe to, to talk about it. If, um, if anyone's interested in hearing more about that, um, we, can, we can talk more at length about, um, about that. Um, great. So um, thanks, I think, that's, uh, I think that's all of my guests. I'm really sorry, I, if I left someone off, uh, I apologize, but speak up. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's uh, who we have uh, today. Um, and so the uh, the format. I, I think we have. Um, I think our numbers are such that it probably makes more sense just to stay all in one room rather than have breakout rooms. Kay, what do you think? <laughs> Kay's giving me a thumbs up. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so I, I think we can just keep it all, all within one room rather than have breakout rooms for different for different people. Um, uh, students, please uh, feel free to um, fire off a question. I think that probably the easiest way to do it is to use the chat function in Zoom um, and um, and send a, a, a question that way, and uh, we'll monitor that and um, answer questions as they um, as they come up. Um, but uh, uh, just to get things started, um, I guess I'll um, I'll ask uh, Danielle to uh, talk a little bit about um, the uh, the idea of a learning community um, and what, um, what's, what's involved with that, like what, what do students get out of that? Absolutely. Um, so the idea behind a learning community is really to surround you, yourself with people who have similar interests, um, to one, form a community of support, but also so we can really hone resources to that area. Um, a lot of our programming is going to look a little different this year because of uh, COVID-19 precautions, which I think you're going to hear a lot across campus, but that does not mean that we're not going to offer things. So in previous years, we've actually had the Learning Center coaches in the kitchenette, so you didn't even have to leave your building to go get um, those services. Um, we're looking if maybe we could do something virtually this year. Um, and then we also really strive to do alumni connections and um, business connections during career fair. Um, so I know we had a dinner with Target last year, um, some representatives that were in recruiting for them. Um, we've had different alumni. Uh, Dean Minerick generally comes and has dinner with the hall at some point. Um, so a lot of that programming is going to look a little different this year, um, but definitely still offering those services. It'll just probably mostly be on Zoom or some other capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also um, have a success course that is part of your first semester um, living in that community. Uh, it's called Creating Your Success. It's a one credit course, um, and it's really geared towards those same ideas of like, how do you make this experience the best experience it can be for you while you're studying to be a computer science person. So um, computer science is not my forte. I am just the connection to all of the resources, um, but the house is led generally by a computer science student. Um, so we actually have a new RA in, this, in the community this year named Grace, um, who we're really excited to have. 
um, who is a computer science student and actually our RA from that community last year, Ethan Robinson, who's also a computer science student, is now an SRA, which is a senior resident assistant, so is still around and on campus and will be involved in that community again this year too. Um, yeah, could you speak a, a little bit about uh, maybe some of the, the special precautions, you know, for, uh, for this year for all students who are living on campus, you know, what, um, what, what, can, what can they expect? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, I think the most basic, clearly, and I think everyone knows this at this point, is that if you're in a public space, you're expected to be wearing a face covering. Um, I know that's been promoted across campus, so I'm hoping most students are well aware of that now. Um, you can, of course, remove your face covering if you're in your room with your door closed. Um, we're trying to hold some more events outdoors because under executive order from the state of Michigan, we do have an indoor social gathering limit of 10 people or less. Um, so some of the more social events that we would normally hold in the halls, we have to think about differently. Um, so hopefully while the weather stays nice, that'll be a lot of things outside um, and transitioning to a virtual format if we need to. Um, we've worked a lot with RAs to come up with some ideas of what that might look like for this year. Um, so definitely still trying to build those connections because we still want this to feel like your home. Um, I am not a representative for dining, but I will say dining will look significantly different. Um, if we have current students or if you came for a tour, there is currently one chair at every one of those round tables and wads um, for social distancing reasons. Um, so that'll definitely look very different, but they're also doing a lot of takeout options, which is a good choice for students. Um, and they are putting more picnic tables across campus in case people do want to eat outdoors as well, because um, that definitely helps prevent that spread. And then of course, we also have an isolation plan and a testing plan all the MTU Flex stuff that you've probably been seeing in your inbox. Um, I suggest you read those. I, I read them every time and I cannot quote all of it back to you. Um, there was an important one to on-campus students today that covers our isolation plan. Um, so if you want details on that, I would dive into that document of what will happen if you show symptoms. Um, so if you fill out that daily symptom monitoring form and you have a sore throat and a fever, what, what happens from there. And so generally that is quarantining in your room until we get a test result. We do have campus isolation rooms that students will be asked to move to if they do have a positive test as well. Um, those are reserved spaces. We have resources and things ready to go for students that need them, helping them transition to those spaces. And you will have a professional staff member assigned to you if that is the case, the entire step of the process. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of those things have been talked about and considered. It's a lot of details, but I'm happy to share if people have specific questions about any of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh, hey, we've got our first question. Yay. Thank you, Thong. Uh, um, so uh, the question is, I'll, I'll be doing fall semester remotely. Um, will I still get all of the benefits uh, for coaching and such? Um, let's see. Uh, is that... Um, coaching through the uh, through the uh, the uh, college of computing learning center is that what you're um is that what the question's about so for the college of computing learning center um we're looking at mostly if not everything being online so if you're doing the semester remotely you'll totally still get all of the benefits um it'll most likely be through zoom but we'll uh, we also have a canvas page so i'm sure that you've already been looking at canvas and so the CCLC has its own Canvas page where we'll also be posting lots of help and tips and tricks for all the courses and everything, as well as the typical one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Mm -hmm. Cool, that's great. Uh, Bonnie, while I've got you uh, there, um, you, you want to talk a little bit about s sort of how, um, how the Learning Center works? I mean, um, you know, I've got a uh, something that's something in me in one of my computing classes. Um, how, how do I how do I get in touch with the learning center, and how does that interaction go? So first off, um, if it was in person, you'd go in person to the learning center. <laughs> but because of COVID and everything, mm -hmm. um, you can either find the online Zoom links like through your through the Canvas page um, on the CCLC website. And if you Google just CCLC MTU, it, it pops right up. Um, also on the MTU website itself, all of our info is there. So pretty much you show up, 
go into the Zoom meeting. Um, just ask your question either in the chat or through voice or anything. And we normally have at least two to three student workers present for each shift. And all the hours and everything like that are also online. Mm -hmm. Might I add something to that? Of course. Um, back in the spring when we had to do a pretty quick transition to being remote, we went through Zoom and sometimes if it was a really busy time, you might have to wait maybe five to 10 minutes before you could get your question answered because I don't know how familiar you all are with Zoom, but typically with it being virtual, you would go into a breakout room with a coach answering the questions directly. So sometimes you'd have to wait for a few minutes until it was your turn. But it seemed to work out pretty well. You still get pretty much the same coaching you would in person. We can still explain things with a whiteboard, give you feedback on your code, all of that sort of stuff. Well, Sarah, maybe I'll shoot another question to you. Um, uh, looking ahead you know, for uh, for students, um, if they um, are interested in joining the um, the learning center, you know, as an employee, as, as a coach, um, how does that how does that work? So, one thing that I'd recommend if you're interested in becoming a coach would be to start out being either a lab assistant or a SAM, which is a student academic mentor for second year classes. That would sort of ease you into it and give you a little more guidance than you'd get being a coach. Um, otherwise, if you're interested in becoming a coach, typically you need to have completed your second year before you can apply. And then at that point, you would contact the learning center coordinator who is Leo Uriel or you could contact Bonnie and she could put you in touch with him and then basically express your interest and send a resume and go from there. Um, a lot of the classes that you'd need to be able to answer questions about would be the first and second year classes at that point. Great, thanks so much. Um, Josh, I'm gonna uh, turn to you and uh, and ask you, uh, this is your opportunity to um, you, <laughs> uh, to talk to incoming students. If there's, um, if there's one, you know, one or, or two things that you see uh, sort of new students possibly struggling with, uh, with IT or having questions about, um, you've got an audience here, so. <laughs> um, Anything, yeah. anything you want to convey to that? Yeah, that's absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity very much. So there's a couple of things that are typical trends amongst new students when they get to campus. Um, the number one thing being students, well, all students are going to return to campus with a laptop this year. Um, but the number one being thing from a support perspective being software installations. So oftentimes, um, especially in the College of Computing, students uh, are pretty self-sufficient and follow instructions and make and when they have resources right in front of them um, they're able to get the software installed on their own but uh, one thing that we like students to be aware of is that there's a web page that you'll have access to um, the first week of the semester called downloads.it.mtu.edu and you don't have to write this down because we communicate it in several different ways and and if you forget it over the course of the semester, because it does persist and it's available all semester long, you can always go to the IT webpage, which is um, mtu.edu slash IT. If you can't remember that for whatever reason, just go to the MTU homepage and search for information technology and it will bring you straight there. Another available, so, so this downloads page that I talk about, you log in with your Michigan Tech username and password. You have one username and password to use throughout campus. It's called single sign-on environment. So whether it's Canvas or BandWeb or, or the downloads page or your email, you're using the same username and password. So in this downloads page, you go in and, and it presents you with a list of available software that you can put on your own device. Um, and that's, that's pretty handy because um, while we do have a computer lab environment on campus with all of the software available to all students, 
oftentimes people like to use that same software on their own devices. If you do run into a snag um, where you're having uh, either difficulty following the instructions or your computer's just acting up, we do have a walk-up service center on the uh, right near the entrance of the library building. So right when you enter the library, immediately to your right, we have our technical assistance center and we're available for walk-up service there. Um, things that we do there are answer um, frontline support questions about like if you have if you're having trouble installing MATLAB or Mathematica or some piece of software, we can offer advice there. Um, if you run into an issue where you need extended IT support, we might schedule a time with you where we can either meet you somewhere or have you drop your equipment off and we can, we can do our best to help uh, from that perspective. The other nice resource that's available from our um, IT homepage is what we call our knowledge base or support center. So, um, excuse me. <clears throat> if you if you go to our support center, then it gives you a list of frequently asked questions. So if you're if if let's say for example you're like, well, how do I connect to your VPN? If you just type in how do I connect to to your VPN, it'll you know take you to a knowledge base article that details line by line, instruction by instruction, how to do things like that. It also gives you the opportunity to put in a support request um, through our online portal where you can interact with um, one of our team members to, to help, help you walk through your issues. So that's one other thing that students don't often know is that the IT department is not just for faculty and staff, it is for students as well. And you can use all of the available resources that we have um, to provide help. So you can call us on the phone. Um, our, our phone number is on the webpage if you don't enjoy phone calls, you can email us at ithelp at mt.edu. You can check out our, <clears throat> our knowledge base. You can also log a ticket directly into our, um, our ticketing system and get help there. So all of those resources on top of the walk-up service center, the downloads page, um, it's just a lot of things that um, it, it'll become kind of just part of life once once you're on campus um, and you know it's it'll turn into a cultural norm where you can just be aware of the resources that are that are here but one thing I like to ensure that students take away <clears throat> is that we really do genuinely care about your success um, we want to make sure that you have access to the support resources and IT help that you might need over the course of your um, career at Michigan Tech in order to be successful from an academic perspective. So we're friendly faces, we're here to help. Um, we always do our best to make sure that you have what you need. And if we, if we can't help you for whatever reason, then we do our best to point you in the right direction so that you can get help. All right, thanks so much, Josh, appreciate it. Yeah, um, you know, and uh, uh, just a, a general rule for all things IT related, um, and just in, in general, um, there are a lot of people out there uh, in, in IT support and elsewhere um, who are just waiting to help you, but you have to ask. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, there, there are a lot, uh, I think IT does a great job of being available in a lot of different ways, um, but uh, you know, make sure that you're you know, uh, active and, and, and um, addressing things that are, you know, that are going on. Um, okay, we've got another uh, message uh, from Thong. Let's see. Um, during computing classes, do we get a chance to learn multiple programming languages or do we stick with one? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, um, I guess I can field that one. Um, you, uh, you definitely are going to learn uh, multiple uh, programming languages uh, as part of the uh, computer science or the software engineering um, programs. Um, for um, for students in applied computing, um, the, the amount of time that you spend you spend uh, working with uh, programming is less, um, but uh, you you certainly get experience with um, with doing programming um, within um, within the computer science and software engineering programs. Um, uh, we start off with Java as our introductory in our introductory programming courses. Uh, and then branch out into some other languages. Um, uh, C, uh, in, uh, in particular, is a course that's that's uh, focused on that. Um, but one thing to that's important to point out um, 
as you're going through those programs is that um, uh, computer science and software engineering are about um, more than just learning a bunch of different programming languages. Um, and one thing that you'll see, I think, um, as you get more experience with them is that the, um, the similarities between different uh, programming languages are much more than their differences. Um, and so you'll you'll get familiarity with Java, with C, and you'll start to, to um, get a kind of a, a familiarity with picking up languages. And you know uh, it'll eventually it gets to the point where just as part of a project that you're working on, you have to learn a new language, and nobody really thinks of that as a big deal anymore. Um, so that's um, that's an important uh, sort of step. Um, in, in your progress sort of as, as a student. So, um, okay, great. Please keep uh, questions coming. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Raphael um, and um, have him, uh, talk, I'm going to pose a question to him. So uh, if you had it to do all over again, um, would you? <laughs> no, uh, but uh, what, what, what would you, um, what would you, what were the, the, the things that, the, the best things that you took away uh, from your computer science, you know, degree? Um, if there were things that you would have done, you know, maybe more of, um, what, what would they be? Sure. Um, one of the things that I think was um, helpful to me, say, as like a freshman, I was one of those folks that came in, had a little bit of self-taught programming experience, but I, uh, struggled a lot with uh, some of my classes. You'll remember that, right, Chuck? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> um, one of the things that was a big deal to me that was something I did want to raise during this call is um, some of the classes uh, you'll end up taking will be very hard and don't, and they might be just hard for you um, and, and don't take that as a negative. Um, one of the things at Tech that was really helpful to me is I remember taking pre-calc uh, as a freshman and I was kind of over my head in that class. And I ended up finding a slower paced version of the same thing in the School of Technology and was able to um, get the background I needed to start tackling some of those harder math classes in the degree later. So that's something I'm really thankful that I did, even though my uh, friends and college roommate made fun of me saying I would never graduate because I was taking these kind of, uh, uh, trying to backpedal a little bit. Uh, but that's something I highly recommend doing, being uh, open to. Um, in terms of the degree, uh, what I liked about the program when I was there is that um, in hindsight, like it's a very traditional computer science program. Like there's pieces of systems engineering, pieces of theory, right? And not, you know, very heavy on that discrete math side. And, and I find, um, What's really awesome about that, um, what I've drawn in my own uh, career and research is how computing works, like understanding things as a foundation and being able to look at everything through that lens of uh, how is it built, what are the pieces, what are the things it's drawn from. And maybe it's something I didn't immediately see as a student, but definitely appreciate afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah th um, thanks for bringing up the, you know, the point. I think, um, for incoming students, sometimes there can be this sense that um, you know they're not um, they're not keeping up with fellow students, or you know somehow uh, you know uh, everyone else is going at uh, you know forty five RPM and they're only going at thirty three and a third RPM. You know it's, it's, uh, that idea that um, yeah everything's got to be so fast, and uh, it it's important I think to be kind of mindful of. Um, as you're going through those classes, which are challenging, um, keep keep a um, keep a sense of okay, how is the pace? Of this? Is is this really um, so fast that it's overwhelming for me? And if so, uh, reach out and talk to people about it. You know, that's um, that's a really an important lesson. If you start applying that early, you, um, you'll you'll uh, I think you'll do very well. So. Cool. Uh, yeah, so we got some, uh, yeah, we got, uh, Corey likes your comment there, right? <laughs> so.
Um, and I also I appreciate your uh, your shout out to uh, the importance of theory. I like that as a as a guy who teaches uh, discrete math. You know, yeah, it's good. It's good. I appreciate that. Um, uh, some of the some of the foundational courses, um, the the material, it's not maybe not obvious. You know what what's the what's the value of this because it's not you know something you can necessarily apply right right off the bat um, and. Um, so some of these things kind of come with time, I think. Um, we're, we're trying to build, you know, um, a uh, sort of, you know, a sort of sophisticated mindset. Um, in well, the ability to reason time. about things, sometimes very, very complex things with a lot of layers of abstraction. And um, in certain situations, if you can't do that well, it can create it can create a lot of unintended consequences. So it's a good toolbox to have. Yeah. Right. Uh, Thong, please, uh, thank you very much for all these uh, 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 messages, the questions. I uh, appreciate that. And other students, please uh, uh, jump in. But uh, Thong's uh, uh, new message, new question is: um, Are classes in uh, College of Computing reading or writing intensive? Um, uh, may maybe I'll let uh, students uh, talk about. Actually, I'm going to let um, Anne. Uh, tackle that one because she has, I haven't had, had her uh, given her a chance to, to talk yet. But um, what's your experience with sort of uh, yeah reading, writing, communication? You know within um, and and you 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 came from the software uh, sorry computer science um, uh, background right? So mm -hmm. yeah, so it really just depends on the class. So some of them are a little bit more theoretical, and there's a little bit more reading, like an algorithms course, for example. You're reading your textbook. Um, writing is not so much, you'll get like your intense reading and writing not from the other, like the humanities department. Um, besides writing code, I mean, that's all pretty much the writing we do and writing comments for your code. Um, there is an ethics class that you'll take, which is a little bit more writing intensive as well. Um, but for the most part, I wouldn't say it's like crazy reading, crazy writing. Um, really just reading your textbook at your own pace just to kind of keep up with the class I think is the most reading that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, I'll just interject one thing in, in uh, that um, there's a special kind of reading that um, and a special kind of writing I suppose too that's a part of um, certainly like um, well I, I'd say really like any any field of computing you know we have we have to be we don't necessarily write a lot but we have to be very precise about what we write. Um, and um, that applies to reading code, but it also applies to the sort of special, careful writing that we, that we do. Um, and that's, um, that's something that really takes some getting used to. And I've noticed that, that students, you know, as, as they, after they graduate and kind of go on um, in their careers, they develop this some sort of sophisticated way of speaking, writing, um, that um, is not, it's not necessarily in like kind of pages and pages of writing, but what they're saying is very precise. They're really paying attention to what they're saying. Um, word, words matter and the way you phrase them uh, matter. Um, that's, you know, uh, the world of computing is all about precision. Um, if you don't, uh, convey things in a precise way, you get in, in, into a lot of trouble. So, um, so I think there's that's a, a, a skill that um, that uh, will, um, if if you can develop that, will really serve you well. So, uh, any any other uh, students, either former students or current students, want to chime in about uh, reading and writing communication? Go for it, Rafi. Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, I forget which blog post I was trying to find it. Uh, there's a saying, and that is, if you've got two people who are semi-equivalent in skills, always hire the better writer. And writing certainly is going to come up a lot in your career, whether it's uh, writing just communication to your manager, getting approval for something, or writing a proposal that could uh, turn around and get your idea funded, uh, maybe through, um, like, one of the things that helped me out in 2011 is uh, DARPA had a program called Cyber Fast Track, and I was able to get a six-figure sum uh, just for my own open source research to kind of keep it going, and that was really helpful. And uh, 
in terms of marketing and getting ideas out to your peers, blogging and things like that, you know, I'll draw from just solid writing, solid communication skills. So I'm a, and tech, uh, when I was there, had like a, a big emphasis on scientific and technical communication, right? Um, still, still a big emphasis there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I right. mean, that's something that um, I know I benefited from. I know it's outside the department, but it's certainly part of the curriculum and uh, something that's really, really, really important, I think. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, I've got a, a faculty member here who would like to uh, say a few words. I'm going to introduce uh, Keith Vertanen. Hello, everybody. So I'm Keith. Uh, so I teach part of the course you'll see in your first or second year, uh, CS 1142. Uh, and so that's a course where we do like uh, MIPS programming and C programming. Um, so, uh, so I might see you this year or uh, next year. Uh, and so, and my other ulterior evil motive for showing up is uh, so I do a lot of research and often it uh, sometimes involves undergraduate researchers. Uh, and I've got a project actually in collaboration with MIT right now. Uh, and my undergraduate student at MIT is looking to recruit a few more people for the study. Uh, and so if you're interested in what, what it's like to do undergraduate research, you could actually maybe take part in the study and you'd kind of see uh, the other side of it anyway. And you'd be able to talk to, you actually will meet with Nick, the student at MIT, and he'll take you through the study. Uh, and you also make $150. Uh, which is pretty cool. And so uh, I'll paste the details into the chat. Uh, I think I can paste. I don't seem to be able to paste. Hmm. What's wrong with my paste function? Hmm. Okay. Well, I will somehow figure out how to paste before this ends. But uh, so if anybody has any other questions for me, uh, uh, yeah. let me know. <laughs> Wait, uh, could you talk a little bit about the study? Uh, oh yeah, so the study is basically, uh, so we are working on uh, a, an assistive keyboard. So uh, people with some sort of disability, so if you think of someone like Stephen Hawking, uh, they can't type. And so uh, in the case of Stephen Hawking, he could just actuate a little uh, switch by twitching uh, a muscle on his eyebrow. Um, and so what we're looking at in this study is actually an interface called Nomen and Nomen allows you to sort of um, uh, communicate by just pushing a single button. Um, and so we're comparing that uh, kind of novel Nomen interface with kind of the conventional way uh, a single switch uh, user would communicate. Um, and so uh, that's the idea. Uh, and let's see. And I can pack, and it's actually uh, available. So I can actually paste that. You can go check it out. We actually have a web demo. Uh, I can try and paste the URL of that as well. Um, okay. That's all. Oh, hey, and we have uh, a, 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 someone who's just joined us. Uh, Sophia Farkar is um, uh, another alum. Thank you for, for joining us. Sophia's uh, in California, and so she's um, uh, three hours uh, behind us, and so it's uh, it's still the working day, so I really appreciate that uh, you're taking the time to, to join us. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> uh, you want, want to say a little bit about uh, yourself, what, what, you're, what, you're, what you did here at Tech and what you're doing now? Yeah, so I, um, I did the, the five-year master's in the computer science department. Um, and so I graduated in... Um, 2018 uh, with my undergrad and then 2019 um, with the master's um, and then uh, I took I also ended up doing um, my master's project was sort of a bridge between the computer science and the philosophy department um, so that was a really cool opportunity um, and I actually worked with with Dr. Wallace um, on that, which is pretty fun. Um, and yeah, so that was cool to get to pair sort of those those two interests and um, the the writing actually ended up coming into um, like more of more use in my job now than I originally thought that it would. Um, so that ended up being pairing really well. So right now, um, 
I work at Apple as a uh, threat intelligence analyst. So in their uh, in their cyber um, like cybersecurity, so it's uh, information security department, and then um, I work in cyber threat intelligence. So I actually end up sort of like writing a lot of a lot more reports um, than code actually. <laughs> So, um, but the, the technical skills are still really useful to sort of understand um, reports that I'm reading about, like what's happening and reports on um, the, the technology and stuff. But then uh, the ability to write actually is probably what I use like most on a day to day. So. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah that's, that, thanks for mentioning that because we were, we were just talking about communication and reading and writing and um and all that so yeah i write a lot a lot of reports um and i think it it definitely um i mean like i didn't get hired like directly by my current manager but i think that if someone were looking at a job in like what i do that they would that that would be like pretty much as uh, like right up there with technical skills mm -hmm. as far as like what they look for um We've got uh, someone uh, asking about the uh, the five year master program, the accelerated master program. So we've got Sophia, and also Sophia went through it, um, and um, Anne is currently in it. So um, Anne, you, you uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about um, the process, at least so far. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was in my last semester as a senior that I applied. Uh, so it's just kind of like applying to college again. Um, you go through a whole application process through the graduate school and there are certain recommendations. So there are like two little essay prompts, but I think the maximum is like 500 words. So it's not anything too unmanageable. And then there's a couple letters of recommendation. Um, but after that, it's pretty much just like getting accepted to college again. And then you choose your classes and you come right back. So I thought it was really easy to transition from undergrad to graduate because you're already here, you already know the faculty and you just kind of fall right into it. So um, there are a lot of informational sessions going on constantly about how you apply. Uh, there's things that the graduate school will put out about applications and then there's things uh, that the College of Competing will put out about applications. So I went to like every single meeting trying to figure out what the process was and it's constantly changing. So um, definitely recommend looking out for those meetings and going to them and just taking notes. Yeah, okay. um, yeah I'll just chime in. So I, I've, I've had the pleasure of having both Anne and Sophia uh, as the students in the Accelerated Master's Program. Um, and uh, my, uh, my simple advice, if, if you're interested in that, um, is uh, keep that in in your mind um, you know your, your first year first couple of years um, be, really be sort of thinking about something that motivates you that really drives you um, and that could be either something that is sort of deeply within you know computing itself or it could be some like a crossover um, I'd say like Sophia and, and Anne are both kind of working at, their, their master's projects are, are both about kind of crossing over into other um, into other fields that's perfectly okay too um, but um, this, you know, the um, the sooner that you can kind of connect with um, a faculty member and say, hey, I, I'm really interested in this. Could we do a project together? Um, the the better. Um, and um, you don't have to have all of the details worked out <laughs> ahead of time. That's part of the project. Um, but but um, starting that conversation. Um, and and getting things rolling is uh, is an important thing. And and the, the sooner you do that, um, you know, the, simply the more time you have to work on the um, on on your on your master's project. So, yeah. but it's also the case that you don't have to do a master's project. You can do a coursework master for the fifth year. Fifth year master. That okay, the, absolutely that is true. Right. Exactly. Right. And it's also it is indeed um, possible to do a, a coursework only. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just jump in as an academic advisor also and let you know that with the five-year master's at Michigan Tech, you can take two courses as an undergraduate that are going to apply to your master's degree. That takes you down from 30 credits required for a master's to 24. And you can talk to Anne and Sophia and 
about how long it takes, but you should be able to do two 12 credit semesters and be done in a full in one year. Or you could do three 10 credits and be done, you know, take a summer up in beautiful Houghton and then you'd be finished for there too. And uh, as, uh, this applies to all students, but, uh, but I think especially if you're, if you're um, thinking about doing the accelerated master's program, if you want to have it go smoothly and finish up in five years and, and everything, um, it's even more important to be in touch with academic advisors and make sure that you're, you've got a plan in place. Um, there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of uh, degree requirements uh, in our programs and um, uh, if you're in touch with advisors and, and keeping up keeping up to date keeping them up to date on what and what's going on with you, um, things can go just smoothly. It's fine. But um, every you know every now and then there'll be a student who we lose touch with um, who doesn't come and get advice, and then um, that can be problematic. <laughs> so so stay in touch with uh, with Kay or with uh, with Denise. Um, uh, our two academic advisors. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, we've got another, um, another question from Thong. Um, what advice would you give to students pursuing a career in this subject? Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. I guess it depends on what the subject is, but, um, let's see. Well, uh, Rafi's given, uh, given some advice. He's got more advice. He's raising his hand. All right. What have you got for us? Hey. Hey. I'd say um, don't think of um, your degree as a job description or your future job description, but go into it with the understanding that you're getting a background, a foundation, and whatever you choose to go do afterwards could be anything, right? Like um, you could go become a business leader, a manager, you could become a a programmer architecting something very exciting, important, or even a threat intelligence analyst chasing down a very sophisticated nation state actor mm -hmm. and, um, and unraveling that puzzle. And so the, the best advice I would have is find something that is exciting and interesting to you. And one way to explore like different things is certainly our wonderful uh, opportunities for internships and co-ops. I think Michigan Tech was always really, really good at emphasizing that and get as many of those under your uh, belt as you can while you're there, because that will help you decide what you want to go do next. Let's see uh, how, okay, so uh, Corey's asking, how difficult would it be to switch to a master's program after your first or second year, assuming you originally planned on a four-year bachelor's? Oh, okay. Um, I would uh, I would say not difficult at all. That's that's okay. Um, uh, it's uh, ar around your third year. Um, if if you're going to do a um, a thesis or report um, option for your for your masters, then um, that's the time I think when it's you should be thinking about who you'd want to work with um, on that. Um, so. Uh, first and second year, uh, you've got plenty to, to be to, to keep yourself occupied. I wouldn't worry about that yet. Um, so um, first and second year, I think the, the best thing you can do is to keep your mind open um, and think about what it is, as Rafi pointed out, what, what it is that sort of excites you, that really motivates you. Um, just be kind of mindful of that. Um, and um, then yeah, so when third year rolls around, you can start thinking about okay, yeah, what's the next what's the next step for me? Mm -hmm. I can also speak to that a little bit. Um, I really didn't decide for sure to do the accelerated master's program until I like submitted my application and was was accepted. So I was thinking about it, but I was very much on the fence. So it's also okay to not know what you're doing until like the last minute. Mm -hmm. Not recommended because it's very stressful, but it is possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think yeah, things are working out fine with your with your masters, um, but it's just the er, the earlier you can get involved, it's just the more opportunity there is to do interesting stuff. I mean, it's fun. It's fun to do a you know thesis or a project. Um, you know, you're really like applying um, stuff that you know. Uh, 
that you've learned. And so, yeah, you just have more opportunity to, to do that. So. I think like kind of on, on this and then also the next question, which was about like AP credits. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like, so at least for me, it didn't affect it. Like I was also more similar to Anne in that like, I didn't really fully decide until um, later. Um, but uh, with like, as far as AP credits, like it doesn't, it didn't really um, like affect it directly very much. But the one thing that I will say is I think that having taken some AP credits like in um, when I was in high school did give me a little bit more wiggle room in my schedule, which sort of allowed me to take like some classes that were degree requirements a little bit earlier, which sort of allowed me to take grad level classes like a little bit earlier, just in things that I was just interested in, not necessarily because I was doing it to pursue um, a master specifically. And so I think that while it isn't like you'll be able to use those credits um, like towards your uh, masters or sometimes you, you may not even be able to use them as like specific courses, but they can um, use, be used as some of the uh, like free electives or it, it depends. You have, you have to talk to someone who's, who is an expert in like which courses they can be used for, but it did allow me the ability to sort of like play with my schedule a little bit more, which does give you flexibility in terms of fifth year masters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I came in with um, a lot of AP credit, so that's how I was able to graduate from undergrad a semester early, so I'm on like a four and a half year master plan. Um, and I also just think that AP credits were really helpful in preparing me for college, because when I got here, I was like, oh, I'm already used to this pace because I've been taking AP credits, so they won't go to waste. <laughs> Yeah, um, other questions? Don't be shy, people. What class, uh, what class do you enjoy teaching the most? Oh, okay. Well, uh, hmm, let's see. I guess we, we've got a, a, a bunch of faculty around, um, so um, uh, I, I can I can jump in here. Um, uh, the class I um, what class do I enjoy teaching the most? Uh, which you know which of my children do I love the most? I don't know. Um, it's hard. To say. Uh, I the the courses I teach um, tend to be in um, either the mathematical foundations of computer science. Um, like poor Raffi had to endure me, you know, my, my first class I ever taught. Uh, um, and I, I really love that that topic because I, I think it's important, you know, like I was talking about that idea of sort of being precise is actually like a skill that you have to practice. And so I, I, I really find that's very, um, I, I, I think those those courses are, um, are really important and I enjoy them. I'm not sure that my students always enjoy them, but uh, I will, you know, uh, but I, I think they're valuable. Um, and other courses that I teach are in um, software engineering, um, which is sort of the uh, thinking about the, the practice of um, using principles from computer science, you know, in the, the, um, the, the sort of the enterprise of, of building software. Um, so it's, it's thinking about things in a very highly sort of practical and driven kind of way. Um, and that, that's kind of fun to take you know the theory and the, the all these pra it's kind of practices that we've been learning and apply it to say okay now we're going to actually make something with this so that and those are the things that i think are really exciting um so uh let's see uh anyone else your favorite class you enjoyed teaching any other faculty out there want to ju jump in Okay, I'll say something, just because actually was well, okay. Um, I'm unmuted, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm Linda. Ott. Um, so I think since it came up a couple of times as the the ethics course, um, I have to say right now that's absolutely positively one of my most favorite classes to teach, partly because there is so freaking much happening in the world now that um, computing impacts 
And so every, almost every day there's things in the news that we can talk about in that course. And so um, it's just really, it just feels really pertinent. And it feels good to sort of think about things, not just in terms of how we develop technology, but the impact of the technology um, and, and both positive and, and some of the problems, um, whether we're talking about privacy or security or bias in algorithms or whatever, there's just so much that's happening right now that makes it really kind of fun. Um, so, but I actually will see those of you who are in computer science or software engineering and CS 1000, and I actually like that class too, because it's always fun to see new students. Um, that's probably my favorite part about teaching the class is seeing all the new students. So mm-hmm. I'll probably be seeing you hopefully in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really, it's an important point about, uh, about ethics, you know, um, I feel like the, uh, and, and uh, students also in, the, in applied computing also um, uh, uh, get the ethics education. And, you know, nowadays, um, not only is is it an important uh, part of you know your job uh, after you graduate and get a career, but you know in some sense you are going to be the you're the computing experts of the future, and you're going to be sort of ambassadors for you know uh, the um, uh, for for the rest of the world in some sense. You know, like the people will be turning to you like, well, you know about computing, right? So what's the right thing here? What's going on? And so you'll you know, you're, it's sort of a responsibility on, on all of our parts to, to be kind of well-versed in the ethical uh, aspects of our, our, our work. Keith, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to chime in on favorite courses. So I guess my favorite course, so I've been teaching sort of intro level CS courses for probably about 11 years. Um, a lot in Java, but here I'm doing, uh, doing course in C. So yeah, I, I really like teaching sort of new people to program and build things in software. Uh, Cause I think that's kind of the most exciting part of computer science and why, in my opinion, Dan can like shut his ears here. Um, I think it's way superior to uh, the engineering disciplines because like, I mean, we can build stuff in the virtual space and we can do it faster <laughs> and more creatively than people have to build with like nuts and bolts and, you know, physical things much more constraining. Uh, so I think that's exciting. And I think, yeah, so I like the intro courses. And I also like, I've taught, uh, you know, some sort of senior level um, software engineering kind of uh, courses, like design patterns or building multi-tier web architectures and things like that. Um, and I enjoy that as well. So I've worked in industry and sort of trying to program the large and doing, you know, big projects, is, you know, bigger software, I think is uh, an important skill. It's a tip- difficult one to sort of, maybe teach you know you can it's 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 harder but i mean some of our senior level courses do start to get into this and um what you really learn it is via your internships and uh when you get your first job but um yeah so yeah great thanks um let's see there, there's been a uh the chat uh has been has been going on here uh and someone had a question about um finding summer internships um and I think that uh, uh, various people have done a very good job of answering that in the chat. Um, career fair is a um, is a great thing uh, at Tech, um, and the career services um, uh, uh, department on campus is um, is also a, a huge resource. Again, it's all about getting out there and you know making making yourself known. Right, um, if you're interested in that. There are people out there who are um, uh, willing to willing to help you, but you got to you have to make the first move. Um, but yeah, I like all this uh, uh, great advice from Sophia and Anne. That's good. Thanks. Um, let's see. Corey's got a question about um, about math. Okay, right. So every right um, math is uh, is definitely. Um, Part of the, our curriculum, um, and uh, and yet yeah, I, I know many stories of students who um, have um, you know uh, uh, struggled in math courses. It doesn't it doesn't come easy, and and, and all that, um, and have come out just fine uh, in the end. But um, 
let's see, uh, Rafi, since you brought it up, you, you want to uh, comment a little more on, on that? Yeah, let's see here. Okay, I'm back. I was actually laughing uh, off camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, and I was giggling because um, I remember, I was trying to find the name of it, but I remember taking some of the classes I took at Tech, like recreational mathematics, where we talked about Alice in Wonderland and uh, went through just a bunch of like the fun side of math or there was a class, I think it was with uh, Dr. Tammy Olson that was all about like just exploring like graph theory or whatever topic we wanted. And my, uh, my uh, what I kind of took away from like that experience is, you know, coming in, I was intimidated by kind of what we would call the plug and chug math, like memorizing these complex steps and formulas. But really math is just a way of understanding the world and uh, making, uh, having some sort of logical consistency to what you're describing and being able to make predictions with it. So, and I feel like at the end of my uh, undergrad, like, you know, I was better equipped to pick up what I needed to uh, for the, you know, few places in, in my own work that um, did involve some more math. So yeah. yeah, I'd say for anybody like just you know the help is there and you'll you'll be fine. It's not that bad. It's it is hard. It's stuff. It's you know it's a, a lot of material, but it's good stuff too. Yeah, right. you know, it, it, uh, in a lot of for a lot of high school students, um, the the um, sort of trajectory of their math education is, is often sort of calculus oriented. They're kind of aiming towards taking calculus, maybe taking calculus in high school. Um, and so on, and um, and calc is uh, is a requirement for certainly for computer science and software engineering degrees. Um, but it also, but at the same time, um, for all of the computing programs, both in applied computing and, and computer science, the kind of math that really matters to us is um, is a different kind of math. We call it discrete mathematics, um, and um, that's uh, based in a sort of different kind of uh, tradition. The, 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 the kinds of things that you do in it are, are different. So we're talking about things like um, uh, logic and graph theory, um, combinatorics, the, the math, mathematics of counting. Um, and so, and so, it's, um, so I think that there's an opportunity maybe for students who have, um, are drowning in calculus or don't like calc or whatever, uh, to actually pick up discrete math and, and kind of enjoy it. I've, I've noticed this, you know, for, for some students, like, oh, you mean this is math too? Um, and it's a, it's a different kind of experience, um, which, you, uh, which you might actually like and, and do well in. So, um, but, uh, but that said, you know, uh, also there's, there are plenty of resources on campus. Um, the, math, the math department, uh, just like College of Computing, has a learning center. Um, and uh, a lot of opportunity for you know to, to get help with your um, with your math related courses. Um, let's see, maybe other people have been chatting about things here. Let's see. Um, okay, uh, Josh has got uh, left behind a uh, a link to the uh, IT uh, website, so mtu.edu/it. Um, Okay, well, seven o'clock has rolled around, um, and I think maybe we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Um, if you have um, any other questions on anything we've been talking about, um, you should certainly feel free to contact me or any of the any of our guests. Um, and um, thank you very much for uh, for attending. Um, and Danielle is mentioning that um, yeah. It's, yeah please feel free to contact her if you have uh, questions about, um, about housing. All right, great. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, and uh, yeah, best of luck.